Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. I think the guys at the top, I think there are two guys with superstar potential, but I also think there are two guys with major bust potential, maybe three of the top four players with major bust potential. And, and those two guys are not the guys that you think. Uh, I am not as high on James Wiseman and Anthony Edwards as everybody else. And look, I'll get into it in a minute. Doesn't mean I don't think they have the potential to be good players, uh, valuable players, important players, players who make a lot of money throughout the course of their careers. At the same time, when you're drafting number one, when you're drafting in the top three, top five, in most circumstances, you're drafting for a guy that is a game changer, a franchise changer, and I don't believe those two guys are it. I do believe there are two guys that at least have the potential to get there, and so let's start with them. This is a positive vibes only kind of show, and the first one is LaMelo Ball. And look, if you're just out on LaMelo Ball, like I get it, right? Because I can't ever remember a kid coming into the NBA with more kind of off-the-court distractions and question marks and weird stuff than LaMelo. Some of it is self-inflicted, some of it isn't, some of it's out of his control, but you obviously, one, you have his family, right? LaVar, he was there, he's not there, he's quiet, he's been keeping to himself during this draft process, but you know LaVar is only one weird interview with TMZ or the Aaron Torres podcast or something bizarre uh, from making headlines and causing you a headache if you're LaMelo and if you're the team that picks him. Two, I do think Lonzo's a factor. I like Lonzo. I've known Lonzo since he was 16. I think he's a good guy. I don't know that he has been quite as bad as people make him out to be in the NBA, but he was also sold to us as the future face of the franchise with the Los Angeles Lakers. He has clearly not lived up to the hype, and if you want to say, well, LaMelo is his younger brother, they play kind of a similar style, uh, and Lonzo didn't live up to the hype, why should I believe his brother will? I get that too. There is LaMelo's weird background where he started high school in Chino Hills, uh, won a state championship with his two older brothers. Ironically, one of the starters on that team was actually Onyeka Kongwu, who is actually in this NBA draft and could be a top 10 pick out of UCLA. But after Chino Hills, he goes to Lithuania for a year. He comes back. He plays at Spire Academy. He goes to Australia for a year. Now he's back. And even in all of that, there were questions beyond just the weird path, right? He goes to Spire. It's kind of a high school that's not really a high school. And is he even eligible to play high school basketball? Uh, in Australia, he has good stats, but the team stinks. And there's questions about is everything being built around him and for him? And so, like, look, if you're just out on LaMelo, I get it. What I can also tell you, though, the kid is a hooper. And you can say whatever you want about the experience in Australia. And trust me, I crushed that league on this podcast a year ago. But LaMelo did still spend a year playing against grown men in Australia and largely held his own. If you haven't paid attention, and I forgive you if you're not paying attention to the National Basketball League in Australia, LaMelo in 12 games in that season before he got hurt and came home averaged 17 points eight rebounds and seven assists a game with two triple doubles. And this is against grown men. I mean, legitimate guys that played in the NBA. We're talking about good basketball players that play in this that league. Is it the NBA? No, but it's better than college basketball. And I love college basketball. And so I don't think we need to discredit what LaMelo did. I think we have to appreciate the fact that he was about as good as any teenager could have possibly been in that scenario. For comparison's sake, RJ Hampton top 10 recruit coming out of high school, averaged eight points and two assists in that league and really struggled. LaMelo held his own. I also don't think the comps to Lonzo are completely fair. Uh, if you remember, David Grace, the former UCLA assistant coach, came on this podcast in the summer and we talked a lot about LaMelo. He's known LaMelo since LaMelo was in seventh or eighth grade when Coach Grace started recruiting Lonzo to come to UCLA. And Coach Grace said like straight up, LaMelo's got some a-hole to him. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He's got a little bit more edge than Lonzo does, and it reflects a story that I'm about to tell. First time I saw LaMelo, he was about 13 years old, in eighth grade, playing with Lonzo and their older brothers in a summer event, and the kid was fearless, okay? 
uh, it's kind of cool, honestly, c- to come full circle to see him as a 12, 13-year-old and now as the potential number one pick in the draft. But when I think back to that day, like I said, 12, 13 years old, fearless, driving in, getting fouled by kids that are 50, 60, 70 pounds heavier than him, hitting threes, doing all this stuff. And I'll tell you now, like, like I had college coaches tell me when he was still playing AAU as a eighth grader, ninth grader, that they had never seen anyone better at his age. And so I understand the downside, but I do believe that the upside is there where I kind of get it if you're in on LaMelo Ball because I do still think he has the highest upside, but I also, like I said, understand if you are going to pass on him altogether because you're just afraid of the -the off-the-court stuff. I will say this, though. Talked to a lot of people over the course of the weekend. The consensus seems to be that LaMelo is going to go number one to Minnesota. We'll see if that happens. The other guy in this draft that I do want to talk about that I do believe is uh, the chance to be a franchise-changing player um, is a guy that's been on this podcast, is a guy that's going to come on after me, and that's Obi Toppin. And I'm not saying nice things about Obi Toppin because he came on the podcast because he did an interview, but first of all, just listen to the interview. Sounds like an adult, sounds like a grown man, yes sir, no sir, at the very least, he's going to come into your organization, cause no problems, have no trouble, be a good citizen, be a good role model, and just be a likable guy in the locker room. Beyond that, though, the kid can hoop, and I think, I understand if you watched them last year at Dayton, and oh, it's Dayton, and what does it even mean? The kid's six foot nine, six ten, um, can uh, can crazy athlete, 39% from three, and kind of in this new era of basketball where big guys got to be able to shoot, he's a shooter, he's a slasher, he's a finisher, he's powerful, he's physically imposing at the college level, and I think it translates to the NBA level. Beyond that, and I do think this matters, and we'll get to why in a minute with Anthony Edwards, the guy was a winner in college, and like I know that like playing college basketball, it's not a be-all, end-all, and it, the, the, you know, the best players in college don't always and often don't make the best players in the NBA, but like I do think it matters that we never, ever, ever consider, like is a guy a winner, can he elevate teammates when we're talking about the NBA draft, right? Like I think back all the way to the Andrew Wiggins year where Andrew Wiggins just kind of floated through college basketball and like once every two or three games, you'd see him have some highlight dunk and you'd be like, oh my God, that kid is special. But if you really watch the games, there was never that one moment that you were like, oh my goodness, that is the there's that kid is can't miss. Like at some point, it can't just be about physical tools. You got to perform when it matters. You got to make shots when it matters. You got to elevate your team when it matters. And Obi Toppin did that for a whole year at Dayton. And the final thing with Obi Toppin before we get to why I'm out on Anthony Edwards and James Wiseman, with Obi Toppin, I think the other thing that you absolutely have to consider is that I keep hearing this narrative of like, oh my goodness, he's he's too old, he's 22, there's no upside left at all. You always have to take the younger player because of upside. I'll just tell you this, I think that's complete crap. And I think the best thing that ever happened to Obi Toppin was John Morant having the season that he did last year in the NBA. And what I mean by that is I think that for all these years, there's been this narrative of you always have to take the younger guy with the higher upside. First of all, you think the Memphis Grizzlies regret taking John Morant over R.J. Barrett, even though John Morant was a year older? Because I don't think so. John Morant was the rookie of the year and is going to be a superstar. Heck, I think there's New Orleans Pelicans fans that are freaking out because they took Zion over John Morant, and we'll see how that all plays out, but I think John Morant just squashed this narrative that you have to always go younger. Beyond that, look at the NBA. Steph Curry, three years in college at Davidson. Dame Lillard, four years of college at Weber State. Draymond Green, four years of college. Klay Thompson, three years of college. James Harden, three years of college. Like this narrative that you always have to go with the younger guy, it's getting dispelled because the older players, the guys that are coming in later, are performing and are turning into stars as well. That was a narrative on Damian Lillard when he came in. Well, I mean, he's 22. I mean, how much better can he get? The answer's a lot. Have you watched Damian Lillard? He's incredible. And there's no reason it can't be Obi Toppin on top of the fact of this. How about this? The fact that even though he's 22, even though he's considered quote-unquote older than everybody else, um, there's another factor that we also have to consider, and that's this. 
he may be older in terms of years, but in terms of how he plays his body, his adjustment to the game of basketball, he's still pretty young. And what I mean by that is this. He is a kid that he is 22 years old, but as a junior in high school, he was six foot two. As a senior in high school, he was six foot five. He is now six foot nine, which means uh, I'm not great at math, but that's a seven inch growth spurt over the last five years. And so while he's older by calendar years, I think he's very much still developing into the player that he's going to be because he's only been playing as a six foot nine guy for two or three years now. That is why I'm in on Obi Top, and I'll just tell you the truth. It's not because he came on this podcast. It's not because he's going to join me here in about 15 minutes. I think he's the best player in the draft. I would take him number one overall. I really would.